hymn number 107. singing let's go lord in prayer heavenly father thank you lord for uh today and thank you for an opportunity to be here again and lord we do thank you for that song we got to sing and, and lord hopefully it glorified you with our our singing to you i pray that you'd help us lord as we should take everything to you in prayer especially thinking about tonight with the prayer request coming i pray that you'd help us to remember to bring things to you pray you'd be with pastors who brings your word now give him what to, what we need tonight in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We start off tonight by reading a, a letter from one of our missionaries, uh, Brother Brother Hanson, a missionary to Chile. And so as soon as I find my glasses, I reckon there it is. Otherwise, there won't be any reading tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> Boy, I tell you, you know, I don't know what happened. Ten years ago, I didn't need these things, but kind of went downhill pretty quick. All right, this right here is uh, Brother Hanson from Chile. This is the November-December prayer letter. It says, A certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him. Luke 10.30. That sounds familiar. That's what I preached this past Sunday. It says, Our journey back home to Puta Arenas was two months overdue because of the airline's inability to fly us back because of an expiration date on our visas extension. I never felt so low watching people board the plane and told I could not go back to our home in Chile. I think that after this year, we can all relate to wanting to go home. For now, our home is in this temporal body, 2 Corinthians 5, 6. But one day we'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord, verse 8. So we returned to our house and our church to reconnect with our boys and friends, and we walked right into an outbreak of COVID-19. I did not have any symptoms, but my wife did. And she was uncomfortable, but her symptoms were mild. Our paperwork was approved out of the consulate office in San Francisco, California. About the, about the time it was approved, Chile opened its borders to foreign residents to reenter. We could not have completed our reentry. We could not have completed our reentry had it not been for the people along the way that extended themselves selflessly on our behalf to process paperwork, rearrange schedules, finances, and most importantly, prayed for us, uh, prayed us home. We continue to be inspired by a stranger's kindness and draw comfort even in the darkest nights that hope does still exist. The parable of the Good Samaritan is still 
a relevant picture of mercy extended to our fellow man who was robbed, then saved at the roadside by someone who did not even share in the same religion or culture. This extraordinary act of kindness was a selfless act of, of love with no reward or gain or profit. Still, his merit of grace extended an ordinary citizen in coming to an aid of another. This act of power is a source of enduring hope in, unpredict in unpredictable times and has undoubtedly played out in our own lives. While we could not be with our friend, uh, family or friends during the holidays, <clears throat> our Good Samaritans did emerge on our return uh, to Punta Arenas, reminding me how special we all are. And, and, and no doubt the teaching of Christ has served a more excellent light in the coming together to worship in truth. The account of Jesus' birth as a star shone in the sky gave light to the shepherds, guiding them to the place of his birth, uh, gave, gave hope in uncertain times. As we finish out the remainder of the year into the new, we hope the place of a we we hope to place a gospel message once again in every mailbox, redeeming the time that has been given to us to finish what we started. We are now free without arrest to move about the town during the week. Will you keep this re this region in your prayers? As our government offices, uh, our government officials still have a tyrannical hold in using the virus's spread to keep people in their homes during the weekend. I, I will have to use my time wisely to arrange additional Bible studies with new individuals and resume my Spanish lessons with our teacher. Will you pray for Lisa as she finishes her graduate program? Many opportunities have opened for her, on, for her in online classes. We also have an opportunity to purchase a vehicle thanks to the help of the Robinsons. It will be helpful with the ministry. Happy to be back to the work that the Lord has for us. Thank you, Derek and Lisa Hansen. So they're back in, in country, and we'll just pray that the rest of the missionaries uh, eventually make it back in the places that God wants them to go. And certainly that's all up to the Lord, and that's in His time. So, but we do need to pray for them. <clears throat> all right. Yes. Well, right now, um, Brother, the, the one that's in Bangladesh, uh, yeah, Mary, uh, Moriarty, uh, he's one. Uh, and let's see. Uh, Brother Patterson is not back yet. Uh, and that's the only two, I think, that there are. Uh, well, yes, in the Wallers. And, and that, that could be, well, that could be quite some time, actually. Because, uh, you know, they go different places. I mean, they may get into one place, but they may not be able to get to another. But the timing has to be right, you know. And so, um, so uh, like I said, pray for all of them. The rest of the missionaries uh, are where they're, where they're supposed to be. Except for, well, that's, that's our new missionary. They, he's not back yet, yet either. In fact, it doesn't look good for him going back anytime soon. Oh, really? Yeah. And I don't understand that because I thought that that country's, uh, you know, their, their outbreak was pretty much over from what they say, but I don't know. No, so. All right, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. <coughs> Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> now, tonight may get a little bit more meat, maybe, possibly. We'll see how it goes. Matthew 17. You know, I'm not too worried about throwing out a little bit of meat on Wednesday nights, because I figure if you're here on Wednesday nights, well, then you're ready for the meat. Amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 17, look at verse 1. It says, And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, uh, for the opportunity to be in your house. And, and Father, I'm just uh, thankful for the opportunity to teach your word. And Lord, I'm just thankful that, that, Lord, that you gave us your grace, Lord, and your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for us, Lord, and not only saved our souls, but Lord, also gave us access to the throne of God, that we can come to you in prayer, and gave us the Holy Spirit, Lord, that teaches us the scriptures. Lord, as Christians, we have so much to be thankful for. And Lord, I just pray tonight that you open our ears to the truth and help us to learn from these scriptures, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now here in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus had uh, come into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. And when arriving there, he began warning the disciples about the bad influence of the false doctrine of the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus referred to this as leaven. And then later after that, Jesus made a prophecy about how he would build his church. Now you see all this back in Matthew chapter 16, the previous chapter. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16, 18, Jesus says, he says, And I say also unto thee, 
Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now that's one of the things I think a lot of uh, Christians have missed in Scripture, or maybe sometimes forgets about, maybe sometimes just ignores. And that is, it's not the preacher who builds the church. Okay, I hear a lot of, uh, sometimes I hear people saying, well, you know, this pastor took it, a church that was from this, and then he grew it to this in a certain amount of time. Um, or maybe sometimes they'll say, so and such grew this church to where it's thriving today. I'm just going to tell you, preachers get no credit for that. It's the Lord who builds his church. It's the Lord who adds unto his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's his church, he built it. Okay, And that's one of the things, I'll tell you folks, we need to be careful about us taking any credit or giving glory to ourselves for anything. It's the Lord who does it. Okay, uh, And it's the Lord who gives the increase. It's the Lord's church. He built it. And no one else should ever get the glory other than Jesus Christ for the success of any church. Now, six days later, after Jesus, uh, after this, Jesus spoke to the disciples. And we're told here in chapter 17 that Jesus took the three disciples up on the high mountain, separating them from other disciples. And the three disciples that Jesus takes up on the mountain are Peter, James, and John. Uh, Peter, James, and John are known as the inner circle of Jesus Christ, meaning that these were the three men that were allowed to see certain things, three disciples that were allowed to see certain things that the other disciples weren't allowed to see. And this is one of those things. Uh, there are other, other times that Jesus would just take those three. Um, and we don't know why the Lord singled out those three disciples uh, specifically uh, to let them see or experience things that the other disciples never got to see or experience, but he did. Now, look at verse 2. It says, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Now, what Peter, James, and John saw here was Christ in all of his glory, just as it will be when he returns to this earth to rule and reign. If the rapture were to happen tonight, the view that you would see of Jesus Christ is the exact view that, you would, that Peter, James, and John saw. Uh, at the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back with his armies in heaven, Revelation chapter 19, when people look at Jesus, they're going to see him exactly as Peter, James, and John saw him here. How do we know that? How do we know that this is, that, that this is the way he's going to be at his second coming? Well, look just three verses earlier, back in Matthew chapter 16, look starting at verse 27. Jesus tells everybody exactly what they're going to see. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then, then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now get this. He's standing there right there with them physically. He's already came the first time. The first advent's already happened. He's been born to this earth, and he came to present himself as king. Here in Matthew 16, 28, he's saying, Some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the, the, the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, he wasn't lying. There were some that were standing there that would not die until they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You know who those, those people were? Peter, James, and John. Because starting right there in Matthew 17, 1, that's all of a sudden he takes them up on a mountain and he shows them the Son of Man that will come, the second coming of Christ. You, if you think about this for a second. Do you realize Peter, James, and John got to see both the first advent and the second advent? That's wild, man. I started thinking about that. He got, they got to see Jesus physically standing there as the Lamb of God. And then they get to see him as the Lion of Judah when he comes back. That's what they got to see. Now notice there in chapter 17, starting at verse 2, and it says, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. J just think of it. This is exactly how we're going to see Jesus one of these days when that trump sounds. And we're caught up in the air to be with the Lord. This is the exact same Jesus that you will see when you're absent from the body, present with the Lord. We will see Jesus as he is, and the way he is is the way Peter, James, and John saw him there on that mountain that day. Look at verse 3. It says, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with, with him. Now another reason that we know that Peter, James, and John were looking at Jesus, the way he's going to be when he comes back, second coming of Christ, is because of what we read back in Malachi chapter 4. Turn back to Malachi chapter 4. 
Now, I purposely looked at this because you only got to turn one book back to Malachi. Amen? This one book. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. <clears throat> the very last chapter before the, the years of silence and the birth of Jesus Christ. Very last chapter of the Old Testament. Now, Malachi chapter 4, look if you would at verse 3. It says, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now notice here in this last chapter of Malachi chapter 4 that there are three names mentioned here. Can't miss them. Three names. Which is the same people that Peter, James, and John saw standing there on that mountain. In verse 4 you see the name Moses mentioned. In verse 5 you see the name Elijah mentioned. At the end of verse 5 you see the Lord mentioned. You know what the context is in Malachi chapter 4? It's the second coming of Christ. That is the context of the whole chapter. It's the second coming of Christ. So isn't Peter, James, and John looking there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Uh, aren't they looking at Moses standing there, Elijah standing there, and the Lord standing there? You know what they're looking at? The same thing was prophesied right there in Malachi chapter 4. That's what they're looking at. Okay? And did it not say in Matthew 17 too that the face of Jesus did shine as the sun, S-U-N? That's what it says right there in verse 2. Matthew chapter 17, 2. Now in Malachi chapter 4, look back at verse 2. It says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son, S-U-N, of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of a stall. And then over in Matthew chapter 17, 2, it says his face did shine as the sun, S-U-N. Now you'll notice that the Lord has been likened to the sun in many times in Scripture. Uh, the Bible declares that, uh, you say, well, how is that? Well, the Bible does declare that the heavens will declare his glory. And the S-U-N sun is a picture or type of Christ. It is a type of Christ. Just as the moon is a great picture type of the bride of Christ or believers today who has no light of their own, but what, what is the bride supposed to do? It's supposed to reflect the light of Christ. We have the light of Christ within us. We're supposed to let that light shine out. We're not supposed to hide it. We're not supposed to hide under a bushel. We're not supposed to do these things. Why? We're supposed to let that light shine. And so what you see, you see the sun, S-U-N, is a picture of Christ, the sun, S-O-N. And we are, the moon is a type of us. And when you look up, that's what you see, the glory of the Lord. Now, turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to show you here that just how much of a type the S-U-N son is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, look if you would at verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven." of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firm of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made, he made the stars also. Again, those, those last five words there are some of the most powerful words in that Bible. He made the stars also. That's your God. That's the God that we serve. 17. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. He's talking about the sun, the, 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 time, the, the, the time that the sun, S-U-N, was made. And look what day it was made. Verse 19. And the evening and morning <clears throat> were the first day. Now, or the uh, fourth day, sorry, fourth day. And by the way, those days are 24-hour days. Okay, now I don't want you to misunderstand me tonight. The days of creation were literally 24-hour days. We know that because it says in the evening 
and the morning were the first day. The Hebrew day starts at 6 p.m. and goes from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's been like that since God created the heaven and the earth. <laughs> Amen. So that, we're talking 24-hour days, all right? But uh, you also got to remember, too, that in 2 Peter 3.8, it says a day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. You can say, well, why did you draw all this? Days of creation. With the Lord, a day, was, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. And if you look at this, it says that the sun was made when? Day four. You know when Jesus Christ showed up the first time? At the 4,000 year mark. When you look at the Old Testament, it was very careful to tell you that this person lived this long and that person lived this long and on and on and on. Plus you have the 400 years of silence. You're going to find out that 4,000 years, <clears throat> the 4,000 year mark, that's when the Lord showed the first time. First advent, right? Right on time. That's when the S-U-N, who's a type of Christ, was made at the 4,000 year mark. But it even gets better than that. You say, well, how, how is it going to possibly get better than that? I mean, after all, uh, that, that shows he's right on time. Well, you know what? The Lord is going to be right on time when it comes to the second coming as well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you why. In Matthew chapter 17, look at you what's starting at verse 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, it says this. It says, after, after six days, after six days, Jesus take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up upon a high mountain apart. Now remember, he was going to, he, he, he already showed you there at the end of Matthew chapter 16 that it was going to be the second coming of Christ. Amen? And then after six days. Now, why do you suppose he waited until after six days? We'll turn over to the book of Luke. Luke, and look at Luke chapter 9. Turn over to Luke chapter 9. Now there it said, after six days. So it's after day six, after six days. Now what does it say over in Luke chapter 9? In Luke chapter 9, look at verse 28. And it came to pass there, talking about the exact same event, there it says, and it came to pass about, eight, about in eight days after these sayings, he, put, he took Peter, James, and John and went up into a mountain to pray. So in one passage it says after six days, but the other one says in about an eighth day, so what day would that be? The seventh day. You realize, now think about this. 4,000 years since Christ, it's been roughly 2,000 years since Christ, but there's still... The seventh, remember, what, what did the Lord do on the seventh day? He rested. Amen? There's a time of rest coming for this earth. A time of rest. What is that called? That's the thousand year reign of Christ. There's still another thousand years to go. But now that thousand year reign is going to be, that's when Christ is going to come back. Sometime, I mean, we're right there. Because that's at the end of the 6,000 years right there. The 7,000 7, year actually starts here. So we're right there. But notice he takes them up to show them a high mountain apart after six days and about an eighth day. So when he takes them up there, you know what he's going to be? He's going to be right on time again. Why? Because he's going to come back and he's going to rule away for a 1,000 years. That's what you see. So think about this. Right there in that passage, what he did is he showed you by, by uh, saying the word sun, S-U-N. It said it in Malachi. It said his face did shine as the sun right there in, in Matthew chapter 17. And what he did is he's showing you that, uh, that when he came, he came right on time the first time at 4,000 years. And when he comes back the second time, be right on time again at the 7,000 year mark. Okay? That's what he shows you right there. Now, in Matthew chapter 17, look at verse 2 again. <clears throat> By the way, when the S-U-N shows up, sun, when the sun, the sun comes up, you realize that, that today, do you know what represents us? Darkness. These are dark days. But when, when the sun comes back, it won't be dark anymore. Amen. All right, now Matthew chapter 17, look at verse 2. 
It says, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. That's Jesus' new body. Uh, that's the kind of body you and I are going to get one of these days. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And the way we'll see him on that day is exactly the same way that Peter, James, and John saw him on that mountain. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Look at verse 3. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, notice here that Peter, James, and John, what they were actually looking at. They were looking at Jesus standing there. They were also looking at Moses and Elijah. You know what Moses represents in the Bible? The law. You know what Elijah represents in the Bible? The prophets. So what they were looking at, what they were looking at, what they were looking at Jesus, the law and the prophets, uh, talking about the word of God. For, now you're going to see the phrase, the law and the prophets mentioned a lot in scripture. And when it is, it's talking about the word of God. For example, in Acts 13, 15, it says, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Amen, of brethren, Amen and brethren, if you have any word or exhortation for the people, say on. They were reading the law and the prophets. It's, it's the Old Testament. Acts 24, 14 says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. So what Peter, James, and John were looking at, they were looking at the Lord and the two men who represent the law and the prophets. Now, there are some other places in Scripture where you'll see the Lord mentioned with the law and the prophets. For example, in John chapter 1, verse 45, it says, Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom, uh, whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Right there in that passage you see Jesus in the law and the prophets. All right, now turn if you over to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And probably Luke chapter 16 is the one that probably sticks out in your mind the most when it comes to, you know, when you hear Jesus mentioned or seen with the law and the prophets. In Luke chapter 16, Luke chapter 16 is probably one of the better verses in the New Testament that talks about hell and how hell is going to be. Uh, generally when people talk, uh, preach about hell, they, they use Luke 16. In Luke chapter 16, look if you would at verse 27. It says, then he said, <clears throat> now remember this is, the, the rich man was in hell. He had already asked that, that, that Lazarus be able to uh, dip his finger in water to cool his tongue. And he's basically begging uh, Abraham to go tell his brethren to not come there. Okay. And in verse 27, it says, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now I'm going to tell you something, folks. You hear a lot of preachers preaching today that say, now, hell is just a place separated from God. That's not biblical. Because the Bible says, number one, that God's in every place. <laughs> and two, it's much worse than that. It's a place of torment. There are preachers, uh, big name preachers, who have come out and said that there's no fire in hell. Not according to your Bible. The Bible says there's fire in hell. It says where the, where the, the, the worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. It says that three times in the book of Mark. There's fire there. And he says here, and it says, I have five brethren, verse 28, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. What do you suppose he was talking about there? The Old Testament, the law and the prophets. Because Moses represents the law, because he was given the law, you have the law and the prophets. Look at verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now look what he says, verse 31. And he said to them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Do you know what he just mentioned right there? The Lord, Moses, and Elijah. The Lord, the, the law, and the prophets. 
And, uh, and that's what he's talking about. And so if they, what he's saying is, is they won't, if they won't hear what the scriptures have to say, then they'll not be persuaded even though Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. That's what he's saying. You say, if a per, if a, if a, if, listen, folks, if a person today, when I go up to witness somebody, one of the first things I ask them is this, do you believe the Bible? And if they say, no, I do not, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to hand them a track and I'm going to walk off. You know why? If he, can't be, if he doesn't believe the word of God, then what am I going to say? Amen? Amen? He doesn't believe it. Now, if he says that he believes the word of God, then you can, you can really take that conversation a long way. You know why? Because he's already committed and said that he believes it. Now you take him and show him what it says, that the wage of sin is death, and that we've all come short of the glory of God, and you can keep on saying, you said you believed it. You said you believed it. And then you could show him as a sinner a whole lot easier. But if a fellow says, no, I don't believe, I don't believe the Bible, you know, I, you, you do what you need to do, but I'm just, I, in fact, I'll make sure you always witness somebody. Give them a verse, give them a scripture, give them something. But I, me, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with somebody who says he doesn't believe the book. Okay? And that's what he's saying here. It says that they won't be persuaded even though Jesus Christ be risen from the dead. All right, now turn back to back in Matthew chapter 17. Look at verse 4. It says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now there are those who believe that Peter asks about making tabernacles for Moses and Elijah, uh, that this indicates that it was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles when they saw the second coming of Christ. And some people believe that the second coming of Christ will be in the fall at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that could very well be the case. Uh, certainly there is uh, uh, more than enough scripture that suggests that Jesus was actually born on the day of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. If you want to know about that, you have to stick around the next Christmas. I'll teach it again. Amen. <laughs> well, but that's when he came to the earth the first time. But you need to remember this. The Bible makes it very clear that when it comes to the time of Christ's return, nobody knows that date. Now, I've heard people try to pick a date. I've, I've heard people try to tell when that's going to be, but the Bible is clear. Here's what it says in Acts 1, verses 6 and 7. It says, When they were therefore come together, talking about the disciples, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? What they were saying is, are you going to set up your kingdom right now? <clears throat> And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. No man knows. You say, when do you think the second coming of Christ is? I don't know. Why? No man knows. You can guess all you want to, but no man knows. <laughs> and I will say this, it's a bit foolish to guess too. Just going to th throw that out there. Mark 13, 32 says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So no one knows when the return of Jesus Christ will be when, when he comes back to rule and reign on this earth except for the Father. The angels don't know. Jesus didn't know when it would be. Only God the Father knows when that day will be. All right, Matthew 17, look at verse 4. Again, it says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, this is one of the passages in the Bible that, or one of the verses in the Bible that makes it very clear that, you know, one of the questions that people ask me, they say, are we, are the people up in heaven, uh, are we going to know everybody up there? The answer, yes. You say, how do you know? This, this verse right here is one of the proof texts of that. You say, how is that? Do you know how long Moses and Elijah had been dead when Peter's standing there? Notice nowhere in that verse does Jesus say, Peter, James, John, I'd like to introduce you to Elijah and Moses. Here they are. That's Moses, that's Elijah. He didn't do that. They see Jesus with two men. That's what they see. And all of a sudden, Peter says, should we, should we build, build a tabernacle for Moses, Elijah, and you? Should we do this? How did he know that was Moses and Elijah? They didn't have pictures of people like Moses hanging on the wall back then. <laughs> Amen? So how did he know? God had to reveal that to him. He knew somebody that he had never met before. He knew people that had, Moses had been dead for a long time. Elijah, he had, been, he had been taken up a long time, hundreds of years before Peter ever, ever saw that. But yet, he knew exactly who they were. And may I suggest to you tonight, when you get to heaven, God's going to reveal you to you 
things that would just blow your mind. You, you're going to see people up there that you've never met on this earth, and you're going to know exactly who they are. Now, I'll tell you this. You start thinking really deep on these things. I mean, when you start laying in your bed at night about 2 o'clock in the morning, your eyes are wide awake, and you're thinking about this thing, all kinds of wild scenarios are going to come in your mind. I mean, think about this. Do you realize there's probably somebody who hadn't even been born yet? If you were to die today and you're up there with the Lord in heaven, do you realize that, that somebody that could be born tomorrow, you're going to know who they are and they get there too? That's wild, ain't it? Now, here's another one. I really wasn't going to go this far tonight, but I'm going to do it anyway. A day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. Amen? What that means is this. God is outside of time. Okay? God's not restricted by time. Time didn't even exist until he made the heaven and earth because it says right there, in the beginning he created heaven and the earth. In the beginning of what? Time. There's nothing else. Why? God has no beginning or end. So it has to be time. Now, with the Lord, a day, is, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. If you take that to be literal, which I do, can you imagine? Now, think about this. My dad passed away in 1995. Now, that was what? 15 years ago. Is that, no, 20, 25 years ago. Boy, time flies. 25 years ago. But if a, thousand, if a day of the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years a day, that means a possibility of meaning that all of a sudden if I were to die tonight and be absent from body present with the Lord, and all of a sudden I get there in heaven and I see my dad stand there, he's going to look at me and say, man, it's only been about 15 minutes. Ain't that wild? Yeah. See, that's the things that preachers think about, you know, late at night. Okay. All right. Verse 5. Good to know that we're going to know people up there. Amen. Verse 5. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. But behold, a voice out of the cloud which, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now, this is one of the two times that the voice of God was heard from heaven speaking about how he was pleased with his Son. The first time was back when Jesus was baptized. Uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. Back to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, if you'll notice here, he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But over in Matthew chapter 17, when the voice of God comes again, after he takes him up on the Mount of Transfiguration, notice that the Father adds three words to that. In Matthew chapter 17, 1, he adds the words, Hear ye him. That's pretty good advice right there, amen? The Bible says, He that hath the ear, let him hear. All right, back to Matthew chapter 17, look at verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Elijah wasn't there anymore. Moses wasn't there anymore. And Jesus was just as he was before he took those disciples up on that mountain. And rather than being all of his glory as the Lion of Judah, he is now again the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the whole world. Verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Now, why did Jesus say that? Why did Jesus say, tell the vision to no man? I mean, didn't he want people to know about it? Didn't he want people to know? Why did Jesus tell them to tell no man about the vision that they just saw? Well, remember, the vision that they just saw was Jesus Christ in all of his glory as the King of Kings as the ruler of the whole world, as the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the vision that they just saw. They, they, they saw him when he's going to come back the second time. Now, you'll notice when reading the Gospels that Jesus did not want those who knew that he was, uh, that he was the Christ, the Son of God, to reveal to others that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you say, well, why is that? Well, get John chapter 1 in one, in one hand and get Matthew chapter 16 in another. John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 16. When you read through the scriptures, every time that Jesus would do something or say something or people would see something that would reveal who he was, 
to be the Christ, the Son of the living God, he would say, don't tell anybody about that. Don't tell anybody about that. You say, why is that? John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 16. All right, and John, I'll wait till everybody gets there. John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 16. John chapter 1, Matthew chapter 16. All right, in John chapter 1, look if you would at verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the, whole, the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. Now when he says be made manifest to Israel, that's showing him to be manifest as the Christ, the Son of the living God. In other words, what John was saying was, all you people of Israel, if you will humble yourselves right now and come up here and humble yourselves, get down this water, and when I baptize you, that's going to manifest that to you that Jesus Christ is, is the Son of God and he is the Christ. That's what he's saying. That will be manifest to Israel. All right, now flip over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. He wanted God to reveal to them who he was. He didn't, want, he didn't want other people to, to, to reveal it. He wanted God to reveal it. And, and God would have revealed it if they had gotten down the water and been baptized. He would have been manifest to them. Now, in Matthew chapter 16, look at what we would start in verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Well, those people obviously had not had Jesus Christ manifest to them. Some say Elias. Them guys either. And others, Jeremiah and, 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 or one of the prophets, they had not been baptized yet. They had not been baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus Christ had not been manifest to them yet because they would not humble themselves get down in the water. So they're thinking that he's Jeremiah or Elias or one of the prophets or John the Baptist. Verse 15. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now watch. Verse 17, and Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, watch it, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, gate hell shall not prevail against it. Drop down to verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Why? Because he wanted not flesh and blood to reveal it, but God to reveal it when they would get down and humble themselves and be baptized like they were supposed to. How many of you see that? All right. Now, I'll give you some more verses that, 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 that back that up. Uh, it, look at, um, flip over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I'm trying real hard to keep it in Matthew tonight. I really am. Matthew chapter 12, look at verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, followed him and he healed them all. He healed every one of them. Now only the Son of God could do that. Only the Christ could do that. Look at verse 16. And he charged them that they should not make it known. All right, now flip back to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, look at verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou, son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. Again, only the Lord Jesus Christ would do such a thing. Look at verse 30. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. See that no man know it. All right, Matthew chapter 8. Turn back to Matthew chapter 8. 
Look at verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Now notice he called him Lord, and his leprosy was cleansed. There was no cure for leprosy back then. And yet Jesus, with just one touch and the words, be thou clean, healed this leper. Again, only Christ, the Son of the living God, could do that. Look at verse 4. And Jesus said unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. He wanted God to reveal who he was. And he would have if they had got down and been baptized. He had been, Jesus would have been made manifest to Israel. And if they had all done that, he would have set up his kingdom right then and there. But because they didn't, Jesus showed Peter, James, and John on that mountain that I'm coming again. And this time when I come, I'm not going to look like I do now. Folks, listen, when he comes a second time, he's not coming as a lamb. He's coming as, as the king, the king of kings, the lion of Judah. And listen, he's not going to be mistreated, and nobody's going to lay a hand on him then. Amen? That's what we got to look forward to. I'm looking forward to that. All right, we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. <coughs> and let's take some prayer requests. Brother Phil uh, actually gave me uh, some prayer requests, uh, but my cell phone's not in here. But I do know uh, that he has, uh, his, he has some relatives very close to him that both have cancer. And so he has asked that we pray for them. And, and Sister Sharon, I will give you that information so we can update the prayer list on that. Okay, but we need to pray for uh, Brother Phil's um, relatives who have cancer. And also continue to pray for Brother, Brother Phil and Sister Helen. Uh, their, their daughter was there to help out uh, some uh, recently, but she's went back. Uh, and so... Uh, kind of gave Phil a little bit of a break, which he needed very badly, uh, but continued to pray for them. Continue to pray for Brother Kenny. Continue to pray for Walt. Um, the Barnharts contacted me today, and they're in need of a vehicle. Uh, the vehicle that they were driving is... Well, it gave up the ghost, and uh, they're not. Uh, Dan needs a vehicle to be able to get a job, or to go to work, and so they they asked we would pray about you know them getting a vehicle. So let's let's make sure we pray about that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Continue, pray for our missionaries especially that they'll be able to get back in their, their field soon. Pray for our, our, um, our youth and our teachers. Um, pray for Lily Story's medical. Pray for my wife. She's, she, the back's almost to the point where she can get around. So let's continue to pray for my wife. Um, what else? Make sure we pray for our first responders, law enforcement, fire. You know, here a couple of weeks ago, we were we were having a Saturday uh, pastor's class here. And like every fire truck in the entire country showed up, and, and they had a big rally right here in our parking lot, and we didn't know what was going on. Turned out they, were, they had a, a young child of one of the firefighters um, had just come home from, she was very sick with something, I don't know what it was. 
and uh, she missed her birthday. So what they did was they drove all those fire trucks in front of her house. But I didn't know that's what it was. The first thing I thought was, man, they're here to do a fire inspection. But then I looked, and there were all these different fire trials. Like, boy, they sure brought a lot of people. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, let's do pray for our first responders. Um, let's see. Um, pray for our country. Brother Larry, will you be traveling any this week? Not this week. Amen. 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 What else? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple. Um, just for my physical health, and then um, I have a court hearing for custody of my youngest son um, next week, Thursday, because the first one on Friday, so stay tuned. All right, let's pray for Brother Josh and his health, and uh, that the court hearing will go the way he wants it to go. Let's pray for that. What else? Continue to pray for uh, Sister Barbara, Barbara Bertram. She's looking forward to her son. In April, she thought she should see another uh, mm -hmm. specialist that might be able to help her out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far, I mean, she's went to a lot of doctors, and um, about the only thing that's helping her out is an unexpected side effect. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. Uh, let's continue to pray for her that she's, she's able to get at rest. The problem is that she, she goes to sleep, but then she doesn't sleep very long. She's back awake. And then she falls asleep and she's back awake. And she, she's afraid if she comes to church, she's going to fall asleep. And I told her, I was like, sister, that's happened to me my entire ministry. Amen. <laughs> I was like, just, you know, I wish we had pews. That way you couldn't fall clean out of the thing, you know. But, um, but you know, let's pray that she really wants to come to church. And, uh, but let's just pray that the doctors will have wisdom to, to fix whatever there is there to help her out to sleep. I got a great blessing this past week. Um, um, uh, Julia Archie and uh, Barbara Lynn came in and they painted that back room back there, a teen room. And uh, in fact, they just finished up today. They've been hard at it for three days. And finished up about an hour before the service started. And I thought, man, the paint's going to be wet and everything, but it isn't. It's dry and everything looked good. So that was a great blessing. And so, what else? You know, she's, she's doing better, but we still need to keep her in prayer. Keep Amy forward in your prayers. Uh, let's pray for Arlene Kegley. I didn't know if you knew it or not, but she's moving. Yeah, I know. I didn't know it either until I talked to her. We talked to her uh, yesterday, and she's moving to Scobie. Uh, that's where that is. she's moving to her, her daughter's there. And uh, so just, just keep her in your prayers. She sold her house there in Cascade. And just keep her in your prayers that the move will go smooth and everything. Okay, and she'll be able to find a church there too. So let's make sure we pray for her. What else? Keep uh, Lola Thorson in your prayers and the Zerns. Keep both of them in your prayers. I know that, um, and, and also, you know, I know a lot of people are trying to get that shot, the vaccine, and it's very difficult to do. In fact, I just saw on the news today that they got a phone line now that you can call. You don't have to go online anymore because there are a lot of people like Walt who don't even have a computer. So they got the phone line now that you can actually call and set up, you know, when you're going to get it. But it's, uh, that, those lots are going awfully fast. I know that Brother Phil tried to get the vaccine last week. And he said that he, he, it was 15 minutes, 15 minutes after the time started, and then all 1,500 of the vaccines were gone. And so just pray that the, 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 our older population was able, is able to get it and be able to get both shots, um, you know, as, as soon as possible. Um, I know that I saw today that 18,000 in Montana has had both shots, Okay. Quite a bit a larger number has had their first shot, but 18,000 have had both shots. So just pray for if they're, if they're going to take the vaccine that they're able to get it, if they're going to take it. Also, again, pray for Lola Thorson and Zerns. Did you have a prayer request? I just have one unspoken. Okay. Anybody else have any un unspoken? Okay. Three unspoken. else? 
I have. Um, in fact, uh, his wife called me uh, yesterday. Uh, they are in Huron, South Dakota now. Okay. Yeah, and uh, they, that's something we do need to pray about. Is they, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Huron, South Dakota, but it's not very big. And <laughs> it's out in the middle of nowhere, man. Um, I did find a church there in Huron, though. Believe it or not, an independent Baptist church right there in Huron, South Dakota. The problem is the pastor hasn't called me back yet. So I don't know. I, I'm uh, hoping it's still open. Um, but uh, pray about that. Pray that they'll be able to get to uh, find a church, but also that they'll be able to find a place to live because they're actually staying with a friend 30 miles away from where he actually has to work. And he's working right there in Huron. That's where they're putting up the... And he's working outside again, putting up the you know those windmills. Before he was back inside, but now that they moved him, he's back outside climbing those things. Um, but he, they, they said they do need prayer to find a house because... They said everything there is 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 old. If it if it's if it's for sale, it's old and and ready to come apart. And if it's not for and it's either that or it's not for sale, and somebody's living there. And that's kind of what you get with little bitty towns. I mean, that's kind of kind of way it goes. Uh, but he did say, pray, ask us to pray that he would him and his wife would be able to find a place to either rent or buy or something while they're there. So I I told him I was like, if everything is in that bad of shape, brother, I'd rent. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, we, I know that he was in Missouri for, I think, about 18 months. And I think he's probably going to be in Huron for about the same amount of time. After that, he did say they want to move back. But he's making pretty good money. And, um, and so depending on where the next location is, he may follow him or he may come back here. I don't know. Uh, but we just need to pray that, that he stays in church. And that uh, he's able to find a place to stay. And so be in prayer about that. I talked to him uh, uh, about a week ago. He's doing, he's doing well. Um, we need to pray that, that he'll get back in church. You know, he's one of those who don't feel comfortable coming uh, with a situation with Corona the way it is right now. Uh, mainly because he's around a lot of people where he works, and he doesn't want to take that chance. He's like a lot of the folks in church. But just pray that, uh, that you know, this thing ends soon and we can all get back, back in church. Amen. Amen. Continue to pray for our visitors who've been coming. Pray the Lord will send us more visitors. Pray for revival in this town, too. What else? All right, let's go ahead and pray.